Hi everyone, welcome to this new episode of Carolyn Talks, the podcast that's YouTube channel where I, your host Carolyn Hines, film critic and journalist, speak to film creatives about their work, the industry and what inspires them. And uh, this is one of my episodes for the 2023 Sundance Film Festival and today I am joined by comp, comp- ah, I can't speak, but <laughs> I'm joined... <laughs> I'm joined by a composer and musician, Gene Back, to speak about his work in the new, uh, it's not a rom-com, the new dramedy feature film by Randall Park called Shortcomings. I really enjoyed this film, and I have a lot of questions actually for Gene about the music used in the film. But as usual, before I begin um, my interviews, I usually like to let my guests um, say a bit about themselves and what inspired them to be to going to the field there. And so for you, Gene, what inspired you to become a film composer or just a um, a composer in general? Because I saw on your IMDb, you also do work for like theaters and you also do like music writing and composition as well. Yes. Um, so, you know, my journey as a film composer is a little winding. I, I really never set out to become a film composer. Um, I, I think actually you'd be surprised how many film composers don't. <laughs> um, see that as, you know, their first uh, job or, you know, a career that they envision for themselves. But, um, I, you know, I originally come from a classical music background. I'm a violinist by training. Um, and and really, my composing um, started quite young when I was a, t- a teenager, early teenager. I started writing songs. Mm-hmm. And um, I taught myself guitar and and learned how to produce music uh, by myself and, you know, recorded an album in my parents' basement when I was a kid, you know, on these eight tracks and stuff. (laughs) And so I guess you could really point to that being the genesis of my journey uh, Mm -hmm. as a composer. Um, And it really wasn't until after I finished um, touring with bands and stuff in my early 20s that I actually started to compose for uh, advertising. And that was really kind of the beginning of my journey in terms of composing for media. Um, And because of my skill set as a multi-instrumentalist and I, you know, I could record all these different instruments myself. And of course, with my classical background, I was able to get gigs that were more on the cinematic side, which was really fortunate for me. Um, And that just naturally led to me doing more film work, short films, you know, independent films. Um, And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, And, uh, and here I am now. (laughs) Here you are. And like you said, like, no, most composers don't have a linear um, progression in their careers. And this is so true. I think you're probably the third. Yeah, the third or the fourth composer I've spoken to. And all three of you have said the same thing. Like you started off doing one thing and ended up doing something else completely different. Um, and like I that you, you're a multi-instrumentalist, but you also began in classical background. Like I have to ask this question because me being a fan of classical music and I used to play the violin back in my my younger days. Oh, no <laughs> kidding, really? No, I, no kidding. The violin is actually my personal favorite um, instrument. Out of everything, I love the violin. So I have to ask, what would have been your favorite, what was your favorite classical piece, not only to play, but also to listen to? Oh, wow. That's like uh, asking me my favorite movie, you know? <laughs> um, but favorite piece to play on the violin specifically or uh well you can if you if you we can do specifically for the violin, but just in general, since you're a multi-instrumentalist. Okay, okay. let's see on the violin. Um to be perfectly honest, I haven't like practiced in a while. Like my practicing actually comes like, when no, I'm recording. Like, I've not touched the violin in years. <laughs> so like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, one of my go-tos is really um, the solo box sonatas and partitas. And although those are multiple pieces, you know, they they all have just uh, individual qualities that I enjoy. But there's something, uh, you know, certainly about the um, sonata in G minor, which mm-hmm. um, is such a meditative piece and something that can be played in so many different ways and every single time it's a new experience. And yeah. I think that can really apply a- across a lot of Bach pieces because the way he wrote th- those pieces aren't very prescriptive in its dynamics and markings and things and articulations. It really just opens up 
to uh, itself up to interpretation. And, um, and for me, it's, it's such a wonderful exercise technically, but also thematically, um, emotionally, and, out of a, a, and as a meditative exercise, it's just one of the best things to play when you just need to escape, you know, <laughs> for a little I, bit. I feel you. Bach is one of mine. There's a piece by Bach, and I'm terrible at remembering the names of um, music, but there's a piece by Bach, I think it's in G major, the cello piece, and um, Yo-Yo Ma plays it often, and it's one of these pieces, it's so, it's, um, it feels to me very, depending on the mood you're in, like, it can be very sad and somber, and then it just gets me all emotional, and like even Vivaldi's Spring or Autumn like that, out oh, of the season yeah. series. Whenever I'm feeling emotional and meditative, like that's the see, that's the series I put on the most. I always play Vivaldi's uh, Four Seasons, and it's just ah, uh, gets me all in the the feels and the emotion. But like, yeah, like you back and Vivaldi for me in particular, and of course, you know Beethoven. I like, can't go wrong Beethoven, but like, like I love those pieces where it's open to in, like. There's some composers where when you like, you can't really express their music beyond what they've composed it as. But like for Bach in particular, I find like you can put your, if you're feeling like somber, you can play a, a song that's meant to be um, happy and make it somber because of how he composed his music. So I'm very much like you that way. <laughs> Definitely. I love that. I mean, yeah, I, you know, it, it almost sounds like a, an expected answer to say, to point to Bach because it's, he's, you know, so universally mm-hmm. admired and, and played and performed around the world. Um, but it, you know, it really is one of just the purest forms of like early ish classical music that yeah. you can play. And there aren't many pieces for solo violin, you know, most of the time, um, the, as a solo instrument, it's accompanied by an orchestra or a piano, but, um, Bach is really one of the few composers apart from maybe, um, at least in his counterpart at the time was Telemann who also mm-hmm. wrote solo violin pieces and, and they're beautiful unto themselves. Um, but beyond that, maybe more modern examples would be, um, a, 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 um, a collection of pieces by Eugene, um, Isai, and it's a Belgian composer, um, it, and and a romantic composer mm-hmm. and he actually composed a, a, a suite of solo violin pieces that were kind of based on Bach's solo Ooh, violin pieces. I will have to look except him up more... I... no I, yeah, I, have to look I... Up I don't think I'm familiar with the names so I will I will definitely um, check him out because I'm always I'm a huge fan of like violin pieces in particular I don't know the violin to me is just the instrument that I really connect to a lot emotionally and uh-huh. um and I, I actually I'm gonna bring that back to the to the to the film shortcomings because yeah. but i'm going to do it a little bit later because there's a piece of there's a composition at the end of the film that i thought was very different to the music that plays at the beginning the, for, for the beginning of the um middle what am i saying the three acts of the film but we'll yeah. get to that so like we started talking about classical music and i did actually ask you that for, for um, a particular reason because mm-hmm. like to me the music that we have now would not exist without classical music everything that we have mm-hmm. musically it, originated from particularly classical uh, music particularly the baroque era and the romantic mm-hmm. era you know like you can't you can't get past Bach, you can't get past beethoven you can't get past mozart handel for goodness sakes if you want to if you want if you want to get like all introspective Woo! like influence yeah. like some of the most like you can't have christmas without the hallelujah chorus and you can't have the hallelujah chorus without um uh, without handel but these musicians have influenced so many filmmakers and as well as well as so many composers and how they interpret music, you know, like these, we have a limited number of notes in on the scale. But like, mm-hmm. the, I was thinking about this the other night in the in the car. I was like, we have these finite number of scales, a finite number of notes, but we have like an infinitesimal amount of compositions. And for yeah. you as a composer, like coming from the classical, the classical training and the background, and then being able to create your own work. I'm so impressed that you as a young person taught yourself the guitar because the guitar is not an easy instrument to learn <laughs> at all but you, you you taught yourself and then you taught yourself music production so like taking all of the finite the finiteness of music in the sense that we have this limited number of notes and scores and how does how did that influence you into becoming a composer at the beginning because you said you started out doing um, um commercials 
Mm-hmm. And I thought that was interesting because that actually made me think of the film Karina Karina. You know, really all this character who was writing jingles for commercials. Yes. And like a lot of people don't really, I don't think, pay give like the attention that compositions for commercials deserves because like commercials is very specific. You have to make a very sharp piece of music that has to stick with people and has to make them think of a particular product like 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So like yeah. coming from your background, going into working commercial, tell me, tell me about that part of your career. Well, you know, I had no idea what I was doing when I got my <laughs> first commercial gig. And, you know, it's one of those classic stories where somebody asks you, you know, hey, can you knock this out and, you know, send it to me tomorrow morning? And then you say, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And then in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, my God, how the hell am I going to do this? <laughs> and um, and so, you know, I really it just it was a, a sharp learning curve. You know, nothing teaches you better, in my opinion, um, than learning on the job, especially in the creative field, like when you have a deadline or something. Um, and so I was really forced to figure it all out under pressure. And, um, you know, what I really came to realize, at least composing for commercials, is that you're right. You know, you have to tell a story in such a short period of time, in 15 seconds, 30 seconds, sometimes 90 seconds. And it's about, you know, writing something that sticks with you, whether it's like a tone or a texture or a melody. And, you know, I I think one could argue that that's really like the heart of thematic composing, which is what I really gravitate towards now as a film composer. And some of my favorite film composers are thematic composers, you know, the king of thematic composers, John Williams, of course, although, you know, I'm not a John Williams. I was thinking how <laughs> Zimmer, but you know, John, yeah, John, John is pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I've always gravitated, you know, since I was young, I'd be humming melodies and themes from movies, you know, from classic thematic composers. And I just feel like uh, that really, that background and, um, you know, proclivity towards that style helped me develop, you know, sharp themes for, for commercials, which is, you know, are like just smaller stories, you know, or, or movie. I mean, it's, it's a debate, right. Whether you can call that uh, a short form of a, of a film, but, you know, they all share the same aspects of storytelling in a way. Um, And so, yeah, that's, that, that's kind of how I I approached my thematic composing commercials. And, And really once I started moving into film, I just expanded that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and instead of being condensed in, in 15 seconds or 30 seconds, I just, doing film allows you to expand that and make variations of a theme, you know, that you're not really afforded to in a, in a 30 second format. Right. And speaking about themes, I noticed this film has a very particular theme and you kind of anything we do very interestingly is you kind of take it into three main er- eras of music. Right. And but before we talk about these three era, eras of music, which I thought was interesting, because I was like, I'm imagining this and then I have to play back some scenes. I was like, no, it's there. But before we get there, like talk about working with Randall and how he how you and Randall um got together to work on shortcomings. And then what was it that he told you at the beginning when he said, This is what I want this film to sound like? It has to have a, an identity. Beyond a theme, a film has to have a musical identity because it has to fit the story. Well, and then most importantly, it has to fit the characters and then the visual of the film. Yes. So first of all, Randall is just an absolute joy uh, to work with. And he's become a good uh, one of my good friends now. And I just cannot tell you how proud and privileged I feel to have worked on this with him and um, him entrusting me to deliver the musical story for something that he has worked for over a decade you know wow. essentially to 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 make shortcomings you know come to life and so um I, I just couldn't feel luckier and more grateful and um the way that we actually met was through BAFTA because I um was selected as a BAFTA breakthrough artist mm-hmm. uh and um and they had introduced me to him uh, because BAFTA is, it was so great at, at introducing, you know, expanding my network and just setting up meetings with with various folks in the industry. And, and Randall took the meeting right away. He was just like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> and uh, really just from that first meeting, we really hit it off um, just creatively and personally. And, you know, we had a series of meetings and um, 
he told me about shortcomings a year before uh, he started uh, production on it. Mm, okay. And, uh, you know, right when he finished production, uh, you know, we, we had always been in touch and, and just updating each other on what's going on. And, uh, and yeah, we started talking about um, what he wanted for the score. And um, it was, it, you know, he really had a clear direction of what he wanted on, on sort of a macro level. Um, he was very interested in starting off the movie and ending the movie uh, with lush orchestral cues uh, as, as a bookend. And um, and the idea behind it is that we start off the movie with this kind of, you know, movie within a movie, right? Let's yeah, just call it that. Was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, creating that musical landscape in an orchestral way that maybe you could even imagine hearing in a movie like that, right? Um, but then we end the movie with an expansion of that same orchestral material, but into something that is actually um, really purposeful in its unfolding and becoming the full, uh, or concluding the full arc of Ben, the main character's um, arc. Mm -hmm. and so it was really like starting off with an orchestral cue that, you know, one could say, oh, oh this, could, this could be like the score to that movie in a movie, but then that actually transforms and morphs into the a, a, a much deeper message at the end of the movie so that it sort of passed the baton to become something else and then yeah, yeah and then everything else you know in between um you know the the, the film is kind of split up between the bay area and new york mm -hmm. and so randall was really interested in having the bay area sound like kind of a gritty band and like an indie band you know like and, and we're, we're talking sub pop era um early 90s and that's mm -hmm. very much what informed the graphic novel or at least i, I know adrian was very much into that um tomina who's, who's the writer of, of shortcomings and so uh, we really wanted to capture that feeling of a of an indie band, um, but and then that gets more frenetic and bigger as we transition into New York, and so it's just to give that sonic texture that is appropriate for what what we see and feel in in the Bay Area scenes versus what we feel in New York. Although there is a cohesion in that it it all has that indie feel, but with a little bit of quirkiness thrown in there, and 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 um, you know, I, I I tried to elevate some of the indie feel with a woodwind quartet, and um, that helped with some of the quirkiness and um, and 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 themes that that were built in. Yeah, I'm going with you. Like I just said, it bookends with like a um, a classical piece, and that classical piece comes a bit more noticeable at the end. But at yeah. the beginning of the film, like I just said, I I should I. It's not really a spoiler, is it? Um, so it kind of references Crazy Rich Ish Asians. But what I thought yeah. was interesting, what you did with that, because that is kind of, as you said, a film within a film. It um, and that's a film that's referencing another film. But that film, the 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 film that was that's within a shortcomings. I thought what was interesting with that is that you made it's it's lush because the setting and the scene is is lush and it has that kind of um this big feel. But I thought what was interesting is you added the South Asian. Um, ele musical elements in it so that even if you hadn't watched Crazy Rich Asians, the, the, the instruments, the particular instruments, I'm not sure it's called, but it's one that sounds like it's something that's being plucked a bit. And, um, and it, it, it just lets the audience know this film that's being referenced is one that has South Asian elements. So I want you to talk a bit about that because I thought it was a very smart and a very subtle way of referencing the original film, but also the Asian identity of the original film because this film is about Asian, the Asian American experience and Crazy Rich Asians is about not only Asian Americans, but South, um, South Asian identity as well. So you reference that South Asian identity within the instrumentals itself. So talk about incorporating that into that small little segment that plays in the film, but it can still be recognizable to anyone who knows what you're talking about. Yeah, it's so interesting you picked up on that. I'm, I'm so flattered that you actually did, you know, because it's, <laughs> It's something, you know, like you said, they are subtle cues, right? Uh, subtle little uh, sprinkles of, of things that might help a listener or audience member uh, feel like, hmm, this, this feels like it could be 
you know, crazy rich Asians or, or as something else, you know, or at least in that genre. And, um, you know, funny enough, I, I, in terms of the instrumentation, there, there's some like kind of um, whimsical uses of tabla or, you know, um, uh, like you said, plucked elements like pizzicato and um, and sort of syncopated rhythms that yeah. maybe you might hear in a Southeast Asian setting um, or context rather. And so um, it, it that was all very deliberate. But at the same time, I didn't want to go overboard with it because I was also imagining how would I maybe compose the music for a crazy rich Asians, right? What would my take be mm -hmm. on, on that kind of a score for that kind of a movie? Yeah. And so it was a little tongue in cheek, you know, um, in which um, in, a, in a way playing with the comedy of the you know, the movie within a movie, but also at the same time, imagining, hey, if if I got that score, how would I, you know, approach it orchestrally, mm -hmm. you know, in a way that doesn't make a movie like that so, how do I say? Heavy-handed? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> you know, like, I, uh, because I, I think even in, a, in any movie, it could be the schlockiest thing ever. I think it, any movie can benefit from a thoughtful and interesting score, you mm -hmm. know, no matter what. And, um, and so the, it, it really was a combination of things in, in my approach for that particular scene. Right. And um, you talked about the, the you, like, there's these three, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's these three main sounds. And as you said, like these tones for the film, and they have to do with the specific locations that the film takes place in. So there's the Bay Area, where um, Ben lives with his, um, his girlfriend, Miko, and his best friend, Alice. And I noticed that music for that. So I had a kind of a jazzy, bluesy sound. And there's a, a lot of, um, um, Horn um, elements with regards, I think the I, I, saxophone in particular um, takes a very prominent position in the in the music composition. So talk a bit about making using blues and jazz in particular um, the song for the Bay Area because like I would have it like going into the film you would think more like it would be more like an urban kind of pop kind of song, but you're like no, it's going to be a jazz song. And the funny thing is like the scenes don't really have a particular well quote unquote jazzy feel like they're not like moody or anything like that but like the music is kind of like a soft jazz saxophone led um mm -hmm. composition well that's very interesting that you hear saxophone there uh because there actually wasn't a saxophone in the that's score. the instrument that it sounded like to me or it could be it's not it, i was like it's not a trumpet but it sounded like no. a saxophone it's a woodwind but, yeah. but they're the woodwinds, and and you're right, and 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 that's so interesting that you you identify that as saxophone because the sax is a reed instrument, and mm -hmm. I used you know the bassoon and oboe oh. quite a bit, and so they are in the same family, and so uh, oftentimes you know um, depending on how it's played, a bassoon or uh, an oboe can sound like an alto sax, mm. you know, and a bassoon can have that very guttural, reedy tone yeah. that you know, even a tenor sax can have. So, so it's very interesting that you picked up on that. And it's, it's, it is a little deceiving because there is a bit of a jazzy feel, right? And so that was very, that, that was really cool actually to hear you say, oh, there's like a bit of a sax and, you know, like the jazzy element. And that's all very much true. And, um, and I can tell you that uh, the choice to explore that, um, that feel was derived from actually some of my uh, initial sketches for Ben's theme. Mm -hmm. um, and Ben's theme, uh, there's a cue called uh, Ben being Ben. And um, that really is the, that encapsulates Ben's curmudgeoniness and also some of his romantic side. It's really his whole psyche is embedded into this one cue. Uh, I don't know if you remember, it's after, right after uh, Ben and Miko's first big fight. Yeah, when they're going into the bedroom and he's trying to make up and she's like, I'm not having it. And that's when you really hear it. And I thought it was interesting that you had that for that particular scene, because normally a composition or, or even that particular sound or the jazz genre would be used more for like a, a scene where it's more sensual. 
you know, more sexy, but for them, it's more about anger and about yeah. um, annoyance. Like he's annoying the hell out of her and he's frustrating her. And you use this soft jazz to undertone that. So I thought it was a very interesting um, the choice to make. Yeah. And, and um, you know, where that really, kind of, where, that, where that comes from and the inspiration uh, was from the film 400 Blows. Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, that was a, a very deliberate, um, you know, uh, choice in that, you know, I really wanted to pay tribute to Ben's character and what he's about. He's a criterion film nerd, right? Yeah. And so I just thought, what better place to start than the birth of French New Wave. And so um, there is very interesting pizzicato, like solo violin pizzicato parts in the score of 400 Blows. And and also, you know, a lot of those French scores have a jazzy feel. And, and yeah. of course, jazz was very big in Paris uh, during the 20th century. And so there, a lot of that music is influenced uh, by jazz, or at least in, in film music. And so um, I was really, I, I wanted to capture some of the, the, the quality of, say, 400 Blows or films like that as a tribute to Ben's, um, Ben's character as a criterion nerd and just that being a part of his psyche and that is what's being communicated on screen because you're not being told left and right that this guy is a total film snob. Yeah. And so, you know, part of what I, at least I'm interested in film scoring is communicating things that aren't outwardly said in dialogue or in the script. And so it's all very psychological in a way. Um, but yeah, that that sort of jazzy-ish feel, you know, there's upright bass, there's vibraphone, which is a very jazzy tone you know you don't hear vibraphone a lot um Mm. outside of a like a jazz combo but at the same time i combined it with violin um with both bowed violin and pizzicato violin um to to help create sort of like a weird texture that could feel like jazz but has that kind of weirdness and quirkiness that you might hear from French new wave, which at the time was very experimental. And yeah. so, um, so that was really a big influence in, into why you, you hear sort of um, a fusion jazz and also, you know, semi-classical and experimental uh, feel. Yeah. Like I love the fact that you mentioned the fact that um, Ben is a cinemaphile, like his whole, his whole thing is he is a film snob. It's not, made very blatant within the film but it's just like things that he says and like even coming back from the at the, the beginning where the the film within a film he's coming on he's just like basically talking down the films <laughs> basically calling it like commercial drag you know cor- commercialization drag and then there's him and miko is talking and I, I thought it was very interesting for randall and for the writers to reference a lot of conversations that a lot of um, in, in Asian Americans in particular would have had about uh, crazy rich Asians when it came out, because for a lot of people like this is amazing, it's, a, it's grandiose, it's big, it's expensive. But then it's, I think there's an honesty in having the film and the character of Ben talk about the other side of that, of that, um, I, um, what's the word conversation, you know, like it, it's a big, it, and it's a big win for Asian American, um, representation on screen but then you also still got to talk about the technical almost called technically cultural sacrifices that were made in the film like people talked about color like colorism within the film like people said where are the dark skin southeast asians where are the you know so there were people that talked about that and like ben's character is like that he's curmudgeoning he's rude he's brash he does not listen this guy oh my gosh he does not listen and but then it's also like he's a cinephile. He's someone who loves film. He loves the uh, theater. He he's a manager of a of an independent theater. And like the film also talks about how these independent theaters are dying out. You know they're gradually becoming extinct in North America. And yeah. that I think is informing who this character is. And you inform us who this character is through through your compositions. And that's something I think that that. I love to pay attention to not only as a critic, but just as a fan of film where like I listen to the music to tell me who these characters are, because this is who Ben is. And like using like, uh, for instance, like the jazz and as you said, a French nouveau um, to inform, audibly inform us who he is. It kind of tells us he's deeper than he seems. It's just that he's so caught up in his own head 
and in judging everyone that we don't get to hear, we don't get to see him express the deep and intelligent person he is. And you give us that through the music. Right. And that's, you know, that was exactly what we were going for. And, um, and, you know, it, it's, it's easy to uh, judge a character like Ben, you know, unfairly even, mm. because here's this very unlikable character, right? Very unlikable. And, and, <laughs> I mean, I, I like, un, you know, <laughs> complex characters. He's coming from, but he's unlikable in that, in like, he's one of these people that he must always have the last word, always. Right. And he attacks people at their most vulnerable point. You know, yeah. he's like, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you three times back. And I can kind of relate because I used to be kind of the same. It was very bitey, my mom would say. Um, <laughs> my mom, you're so bitey. Like, but he's kind of like that. But he's unlikable in the sense is like, my guy, you just need to chill out. Just like, relax. Pull it back. Pull it back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, that's that's something I love about that character because he he's more complex than what meets the eye. And I think that's really the point of the movie is that all these characters are flawed in their own way. And, oh. and Asian Americans, you know, um, I think we're gradually getting away from this model minority myth, but it's been very frustrating for say second generation, you know, Asian Americans like myself in which look, we're not all math geeks. We're not all, you know, going to just be the the buddy or whatever, you know, and, and it's, it's just so important to see our community represented in a way that's just simply normal, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and when you think about, someone like Ben, who would be, say, fourth generation Japanese American, right? It, a guy like that has nothing to do with what's going on in Japan, right? Has no cultural ties there. He, he's as American as it gets. So why the hell should he care about something like a garish rom-com that takes place in Singapore? You know, it's like, how is that reflective of his experience being Asian American, you know? And so there's so many, what's beautiful about this debate is that there is no one right answer. Everybody is entitled to their own thoughts and feelings about any particular work and what it means to them. And, and I think all of those are valid, you know, who's to say, mm -hmm. Oh, um, if you like crazy rich Asians, you must just, you know, uh, think that Asians are all rich and and crazy, right? <laughs> uh, but it, it, but it, there is something really to simply seeing an all Asian cast on mm -hmm. screen and being a mainstream success. And there is validity validity to the argument that hey, studios can make money off of Asian actors who are simply being themselves, whether yeah. they're Asian, you know, foreign nationals. Or, a, or entirely Asian Americans, which is the case with shortcomings. Yeah, and that's and the so, thing. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no. So, I, you know, I, I, I just wanted to address the, of how the music is reflecting that with Ben is because you do have some of the curmudgeoniness of some of the, you know, with the main theme is, mm. Mm. and it literally feels like a plodding, like, uh, wah, wah, you know, type of <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but at the same time, it's paired with a bit of romanticism that mm -hmm. may be unexpected, you know, because it's giving him a little bit of benefit of the doubt. Like, hey, there's something more to him than just the curmudgeon, you know, asshole who who's, uh, needs to have the last word. Yeah. And, and the other thing, the other interesting thing about him is that you, you give him a little bit because we're talking about his identity through the music is like as we were, we were talking about for a bit is like there's these three main teams and like when you go across to New York you give him a separate theme in New York like there's New York itself has a theme and his theme when he's in New York is um like I have it what's it sorry if, where's it <laughs> um it's like a, a soft um late 80s early 90s soft rock punk song and yeah. and the interesting thing about that is like for I think for a lot of people they associate New York with jazz music because a lot of mm. a lot of composers use jazz for New York, but yes. you kind of switched yes. it up where you use jazz for the Bay Area for uh, for Los Angeles and you use like a soft punk um, rock song for for New York for for Ben's song when he's there and this is a song where he's more is um, more kind of like lost. Like it feels a bit more um, unsure because this is new territory for him. He's never been to New York, but he's also new, it's new territory for him emotionally and mentally because he's gone, he's going over there to find um, Miko. And also he's like, he's not going to find himself. 
he's just going there with an objective, but his object, but he realizes that he he knows everything when he's in the Bay Area. Like he's he always has the last word. He knows all the history, whatever he's talking about in politics, whatever. He has a very definite idea of who he is in the Bay Area. But in New York, he doesn't know who he is. He's like a fish out of water. So I thought it was interesting that you kind of translated that in the music and you gave him a separate musical identity in the Bay Area. So talk about so now talk talk about that theme of confusion and like being not lonely. But yeah, it's a bit lonely because he's feeling like very put aside in New York. You know, he doesn't. Like he he feels like he's like isolated from everyone. Right. Well, um, yeah, it, it is very interesting how New York is often associated with jazz. And mm-hmm. you know, it, when you the most iconic I can think of is taxi driver, right? Yeah. I mean, it that that you know, Bernard Herman theme, the saxophone, it's that sexy, like New York, you know, sound, jazz sound. But you know, um a big part of what we wanted to capture in the Bay Area was intimacy and it feeling mm-hmm. small. And that is Ben in that in, in that part of his life. He's a, he, you know, he's like trapped in his own world and perspective and, you know, and, and can't get out of it. And once he gets to New York, it really starts to open up, but in a, in a more aggressive and I would say frenetic, chaotic way, mm-hmm. which is all, which is you know that was something that Randall really wanted to capture when it came when by the time we got to New York, we would feel that like anxiety start to bubble and then ultimately like let loose. <laughs> and so um, with some of that rock stuff, I- I'm very much influenced by early early '90s indie, you know, indie rock and 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 early Radiohead. So you'll hear a lot of like tones that are referencing some of that, right? And uh, and to me, no Radiohead. Uh, okay, I'm like 39, so I get where I get the references you're making. <laughs> me too. Well, so I. <laughs> so um, so yeah. Um, to us, it really felt like, uh bringing in more driving energy mm-hmm. in the form of say rock, you know, um, and, uh, and then it transitions into more, even more frenetic, you know, very um, rhythmic and um, syncopated, you know, type of cues um, later on uh, when they're in New York. Um, but yeah, the, the idea was really to, tra- to make the barrier feel small and intimate which is which is why that sort of combo jazz combo setting of vibraphone upright bass um some woodwinds um was really appropriate for the first half of the movie and then once we get into new york it's a lot bigger and it starts to get bigger and then you know ultimately pop in a way mm-hmm. um and so yeah that's that's sort of the the, the basic structure of, of of you know why we chose a, a more intimate almost jazz like sound for the bay area versus a more rock which uh you know rock format when we get to new york and not just straightforward rock you know it's got some clangy met- metallic stuff you know to to make you feel like you're in the energy and freneticism of of new york yeah and you said something that it just made me it's uh it just clicked to my head and you mentioned aggressive and i was wondering i'm like it's aggressive and it was a like, first aggression but yeah ben is aggressive in like his um conversations with Alice and her girlfriend and also in the scenes with Miko, like he, like that's where there's like this intense, um, it's, it's like a building attention. Like he's yeah. like, you know, a big argument is coming and it yeah. is yeah. like, the music has this tension that really underlies it. But then there's moments it goes completely silent. You know, there is no music. There's not even any outside sound coming from, from traffic or nothing. It's just them and these confrontations in the silence. But you mentioned mm-hmm. the word aggressive and it made me think of the scene. The scene where he goes to the club and this girl is doing the performance art. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I but it made me realize I I I would I I hope I get a chance to speak to um to Randall because I have a question with the guy. So like they're talking about immigration. And yeah. like she's like, and it's so and it's like a white group, this white uh, performance arts band, and the music is just kind of this death metal kind of song and she's talking about this is what immigration sounds like i'm like no because if you were an immigrant you would know immigration sounds more like sad music because i'm an immigrant yeah. and i don't i was not feeling no i was i was feeling alone and isolated and despondent um but that made me kind of think about thematically how 
Um, ben actually kind of becomes an immigrant in a sort of obscure way where he comes from the Bay Area and he goes over to New York. But then also um, mm -hmm. Alice and Miko, they themselves in a, again, obscure way, kind of become immigrants themselves because they leave one city and they move to a completely different city. And I like how the film like talks about how like there's different ways of being um, an immigrant or an Asian American in America. You know, because like moving from one city to the next is a big shift. Like they move from the West Coast to the East Coast. So that literally just pops into my head as you were, as you mentioned the word aggression. I'm like, why? But then it made me think about how the film actually does this transition of moving from one place to another and forming a completely new identity. And that happens to Ben too. Like that's why the music also changes because his identity starts to make a shift when he moves, when he doesn't move, but he goes to visit New York. So like he has an identity shift when he makes that transition. Yes. And that is, you know, that is directly reflected in the way that um, I expanded the themes, right? And so with Ben's theme, um, which is that sort of swooping, like, yeah, yeah. you'll actually hear it throughout the movie and evolve um if throughout as we progress and so um not only that there's also a love theme which is a very simple motif this -da 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 -da, and, and you'll hear it you know splattered throughout the score um but all of those little melodies and themes uh are uh, you know take different shapes as, as we get into new york and and after actually the uh the last fight um if if you really pay attention, you'll hear that the love theme is is inverted. Inverted, and so, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I you know employ little uh, techniques like that just to help uh, subconsciously. It's not overt, you know, unless you're really paying attention to it. You know, it's just going to sound like score. But when you really do, then it does help um, convey exactly what you're talking about, which is this character's transformation and willingness to change. Because that's a huge critical part of this film is that here's a guy who is just so resistant to change. Um, and, and all of us, I, I think, can identify with that. Yep. You know, this isn't specific to Asian Americans. I think this is a universal theme. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's really all that it's conveying. It's like, hey, look, this guy, he was stuck. Now he's starting to crack open a little bit. And hey, he hasn't completely changed. But there is the potential to change and, mm -hmm. and sees that within himself by the end of the movie. Yeah, he's taking baby steps. Yeah. And, and like so far, we've talked about how you've kind of like um, done the opposite of what people would have expected for the score with regards to location. But then I think what you did was interesting is you kind of played into the sentimentality at the end. And mm -hmm. I think that and, and I think what you did so brilliantly with that is, is again, like your musical progression in the film follows very carefully the story and the evolution of Ben throughout the story. And this is where like, you this is where you know that composers work very closely, not only with the filmmakers, but also with the characters and understanding who the characters are because they and and the script in particular, because there's a line that Alice tells Ben where she where she's like, are you gonna go and do like the whole romantic um comedy scene where you're gonna take your bag and run down the street and have a romantic um um re 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 reunion and he's like no and if and you think like yeah no that's it's not gonna happen because that's not what this film is this film does not play into tropes not only just tropes of asian Americans, but it does not play into tropes of romantic comedies you know like romantic comedies have very specific tropes and very specific formulas but then at the end you realize it's it is still supposed to be about hopeful it's, it's still supposed to be about hope it's about um being about Ben growing as a person and him looking, being able to look towards a future and having a better life as a, as a man and as a mm -hmm. filmmaker and also as a potential partner for someone. And I thought it was interesting. And that's where you actually make the score predictable, but not in a bad way. This mm -hmm. is where, again, we, at the beginning, at the beginning of the interview, we talked about the orchestral piece that opens up the film and it's the violin and you bring it back and you make it sentimental. And then, mm -hmm. and then that's where it's like the soft, classical music with the violins and the strings and it's getting like big and not not sappy but it's just like oh, hopeful rainbows i can see rainbows in the future so i want you to talk about that because i thought that was so i thought that was so smart where you're just like we are going to actually not play in to a particular kind of like trope and you're just like we're going to do with the music too because that's how the film is like he has to have his happy ending too he has to have 
his hopeful ending, his sunshine and his rainbows, especially with like, he's literally sitting down looking at the bay area. Like I'm looking across the water with the flags flapping behind me. The kids are running in the park laughing. And you're yeah. like, yes, you're going to get your happy swoonful classical music too, Ben. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, that's my favorite piece <laughs> in the film. I love it too, Cause I'm as a huge violin fan. So when I heard it, I was like, ask about the islands. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, and, and thank you for that. I, I really do, um, you know, that piece was very intentionally um, constructed. It was to convey um, not just like a swooping orchestral feel because anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about capturing an emotion, which is um, the feeling of self-acceptance and also feeling like, hey, relax, you know, you can also be both, very intelligent, even curmudgeon -y and critical, but you can also be uh, warm and open um, at the same time. And, you know, that cue for the ending was really encapsulating just everything that happened in the film in, in Ben's mind, not necessarily what is being conveyed mm -hmm. to the audience, like I said, through, you know, before in the conversation through dialogue or the script, it was really to convey like a full circle moment. Okay. We start off with, in, in a way, a parody, the orchestral parody, but actually that then become means something else and something bigger and even more beautiful at the end of it. And so a lot of uh, my reference points were early or I shouldn't say early, but um, some of the more late romantic composers, especially French composers, such as Ravel, or Debussy, and um, there is a romanticism and lushness to it that is also very complex. And um, and so that was really a big reference point for me in wanting to convey musically at the end in, in, in Ben's evolution, because I didn't, I didn't want it to be over the top, mm -hmm. right? It didn't, I didn't, it's not, it, it wasn't meant to, and both Randall and I agreed, like this shouldn't feel like some, huge celebratory thing we should leave space for just a little bit like is he done yet or like is he really gonna change you know and so there's like a question mark at the end and there's a yeah. constant push and pull between consonance and dissonance and mm -hmm. that's something i personally just as a composer and have always been very interested in um i i never like to be as just this straight linear you know a celebratory moment, I think there is, um, it, it was really about capturing the complexity emotionally um, in the end, but also making it feel warm and inviting with a question mark and a bit yeah. of a caveat. <laughs> yeah, because it is an open ending. Like Ben isn't going to do a complete 180 in like one day, in the space of one day, right? Exactly. He's not going to change completely. This is a, he is a work in progress. Right. Yes. And and the other thing about that scene, not only and like as we said, the music isn't like overly dramatic. It's not like super sappy or anything. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is it's more relaxed because this is the first time in the entire film that Ben is actually relaxed. He's never yes. been he, every time he's either tense and or he's like in a in like this very angsty stage because he's having an argument with someone or he's being combative in a discussion or, you know, or he's like always like watching to see what people thinks about him. Like he's very, that's another thing about Ben too. He's very self-conscious. And, like, yes. and like, this is the very, this is only, it's only at the very end of the film in this moment where he has this, this orchestral music where he's sitting down, relaxed and he's enjoying the scenery. You know, it's also, I think the first, and it just occurred to me too, in, in the entire film where we actually get a shot of the sky. Like the, uh -huh. the, ca the camera doesn't really focus on the sky much in this film, but this is the first thing because he's sitting so that you have the sky in the background and, and it feels more open and yeah. lighter and it like, feels like this is just like, okay, man, now you can take a breath. And the music gives that, you know, it gives a pos like you said, the possibility of what's next. Right. And, you know, there's this little moment where he's in an airplane and he's seeing this like the old grandma like crying yeah. like, watching this movie in a movie. Right. So it's this book ending. But there's this very subtle moment where you, there's a shot of his face and in his eyes you see, hmm, maybe I, I should just chill and let this woman, you know, enjoy this movie mm -hmm. that I destroyed at the beginning mm -hmm. of you know, my journey right but you see his his eyes his face recognize okay i gotta just i can chill out here right i don't need to to throw in my judgment or criticism in in that particular moment and that's really when the orchestral stuff starts to unfold mm -hmm.
Yeah, I also thought that in, that scene was also very interesting to me in the composition because in the way how it's um, framed and shot is to me, I also saw that as what you said too, but then it also made me think of how maybe Ben was thinking, you know, but maybe I judged the film a bit too harshly. Yeah. Because if this is something that can make this lady cry, maybe there's something in the film that I miss, right? Absolutely. And he's getting to see, and like the script on the screen, on that screen, it says just beginning. And like, this is a moment also for him. Like you said, like, this is when the orchestral piece begins to play. And it's the beginning of this piece of music, but it's also, this is where Ben really starts to think, I do need to change. You know, this is the beginning of his change. This is also the beginning of his transition and his evolution as a person. And that's, and, and I, I, and I think that's where I think Randall um, and Justin, and like Justin did a fantastic job, but he's so good. I loved him in After Yang. Like that's, that's one of my favorite movies from last year. But I think like his performance and also Randall's directing and your composition really makes this character, as you said, very complex and very layered. And and like this film it is about um, Asian American identity, but it's also um, it's talking, I think, a bit about for people like people in our in our 30s. I'm going to be 40 this year, but people in our thirties, like we still yeah. have so much growing to do, right? Like we yeah. don't know everything. Like we're still maturing in many ways. We're still growing. And like even the title of the film shortcomings, which makes me laugh for very personal reasons, because <laughs> it's something my mom says about my dad, but because <laughs> he's short and his last name is Cummings. So it's like, my mom calls him shortcomings, but like, like the film, <laughs> seriously, so like the film but the film also talks about our own personal shortcomings our own personal failings and and like like ben is a character where you can look and say like we all have the potential to grow you know like we like even all the characters in the film like alice she had she had to grow up to and miko she herself had to grow up to so while it and it kind of also shows how characters like ben people like ben where Yes, they need to mature and grow too. But the people that we think have everything together, they don't and they themselves need to grow because everyone would look at the character of Miko and thinks, oh, she has her whole life together. Oh, no, no, she no. didn't know. She, she's messed up too, but we just didn't know because that's not who the film was about. Right, right. And, you know, it's, it's such a universal theme, which is what I love about this film and what I loved about working on it is because it wasn't just like, about a bunch of, you know, Asians who were immigrants or, you know, there's some elder involved and, you know, there's a Kung Fu martial arts sequence or something. This was really just about normal folks in America who identify as Americans, but also mm-hmm. as Asians. Mm-hmm. Um, but without the attachment to, like I said, uh, some martial arts thing or, or being the sidekick or whatever, you know, it just, um, and, and it is something very specific. Uh, and and this is important to to remark on is that in building the score, so much of it was very directly informed by my own experience, personal experience as an Asian American, second generation. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you how like Korean American, especially Korean music, because Korean music has a very not that the thing is. I think a lot of people don't realize now is like for me, I actually love pastoral music. But, oh like, yeah, I, was, I, I actually because I love pastoral music like. So I don't know. I do not know why, but I hear pastoral music and it makes me think of like some elements of Caribbean culture and Caribbean music. But then there's also like, oh, there's like punk versions of pastoral. And there's like these groups, there's these female groups that sing pop versions of pastoral and trot music too, which I love to try. It's hilarious to me. But like, I, for you, like, as a, like you said, like you're, you're using your own personal experiences as an Asian American, as a Korean American man to c- create this composition for a film that's just about people like you, a mm-hmm. man like you who's just like, I'm Korean American, I'm Asian American, and I'm also just a regular dude who's out here yeah. making music <laughs> for, yeah. for film. So like, what does that mean for you to be have, to be able to have a film, like to be able, what am I saying? To work on a film like this and that you, you're, you draw on your personal experiences, but also just to be able to stay, I'm also just making this as a composer. Yeah, well, I can tell you that this is truly a once in a lifetime experience. You know, mm-hmm. I hope to have it again, but it's very rare, um, as I'm sure many film composers can tell you, that you come across a project that is not only creatively interesting, but personally deeply meaningful. And that started really, you, you know, when I read the graphic novel 
uh, originally, it, it hit me the same way where I just felt seen and heard in a way that I had never felt before. And that is something so many Asian Americans um, would say, you know, in response to when they first read Shortcomings, the graphic novel. And um, composing the music for a story like this, you know, what I brought to the table in terms of my experience as an Asian American was feeling some of the feels that Ben had, you know, beyond his curmudgeoniness, right? Or at least in the subtext, um, there is a lot of internalized racism, which isn't overtly communicated in this movie, right? We, we, there's no moral sort of like lesson about internalized racism overall in this film. It's, it's pretty tucked in there, right? We get moments and you get hints, mm -hmm. but, but I, at least from my perspective in looking at Ben's character, that internalized racism is ever present. It is always there because we are, we continue to be seen as the other, you know, one of the scenes that always breaks my heart and maybe most people might not even bat an eye to it is when he's at this house party and he's trying to open up a beer. Right. And there are some girls at the party. They're saying, Oh, it's a twist off, you know, and they're like, they're messing with him. And he's like awkwardly trying to open this bottle. And then they're like, Oh, we're just, you know, we're just messing with you, you know? And for me, I have been in that situation mm. where I felt like a complete outsider. I'm like the only Asian person in this party. And here I am being essentially like made fun of. Why? Like, wh why are they picking on me? Well, there's something <laughs> as, I'm like, as a bottle, as opening a bottle, right? It could just help from the beginning, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just something that really informed the emotion that I put into the music, you know, that's directly derived from my own experience and emotional experience. And so I think um, that's why you may feel a sensitivity or emotion in the scores, because that is, that is from my own experience as well as being an Asian American man and being in situations like Ben, feeling so awkward, feeling like an outsider or being misunderstood. And so, um, so, but, but beyond that, you know, being Korean, like I, I wasn't trying to throw in Korean music or even pansori or anything like that, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, as much as I love that stuff and actually, you know, pansori, some of the, those songs, which is storytelling, uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's the crux of pansori, right? Some of it sounds like straight up rap battles, you it know, like, does. just like, it sounds like they're, they, a lot of them, they're arguing and they're telling, they're fighting with a person. They're saying, listen, I'm recounting our history. You need to sit in here and listen to everything I'm going to say. And they say, we're like. It was sound like argument, but it's an impassioned retelling of a very, and a lot of them have like very sorrowful stories yeah. and stories are very sad. Yes. <laughs> yeah, us Koreans like to get melodramatic, you know, like arcade dramas and stuff. <laughs> We're a very passionate people. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I was, I, I continue to be a tremendous fan of that music. Mm -hmm. And um, the great thing about world music is that so much of it is is related you know rhythm is universal um cadences vocal cadences are universal um sure the tonalities might be different the scales might be different uh but at, at the core it's just about capturing the emotion and, and your heartbeat or the rhythm within in your body um that and the drive and so, um, but yeah, all those things really helped inform how we approach the music. In, in yeah, fact. no, I love that. Um, to me, one of the re things I love about music, especially my, with my background, like I come from the Caribbean and like our Caribbean music is Calypso, Soca, Dub, um, with a little bit of re and reggae, of course. With, and, but then when you look at how things like uh, rap evolved, or the reggae, like spoken word evolved, all of that, and like how they all inform each other. Mm -hmm. Like for me, um, I just, I love when musicians are able to like, um, and this was something I spoken to another composer about Kalisha Kalashaba, where we were talking about how, especially for um, ethnic composers and ethnic musicians and people of color like us, where we grew up having to use westernized instruments yeah, and adapt it to our own music, you know, and we adapt our music to that. And it shows to me, I always think like people of color in particular are, I think we, we look at music, even like filmmaking and telling stories and composing films um, very differently to, to white people because we're able to bring a more broader perspective and a broader experience 
to these um to these things you know like you as a as a as an asian american man like you brought your experience and being able mm-hmm. to relate to the character of ben yeah, you know yes, yes. and 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 being able to say like i can envision listening to this character having his theme be jazz music you know yeah. and it's about throwing off expectations because there will be people who would listen to the going to this film thinking they, they're expecting like quote unquote Asian sounding music. Yeah. And you're like, no, you're gonna get classical music, you're gonna get jazz, yes. you're gonna get punk, and you're gonna get rock and all of this. And it's and it's about showing how for me, people of color are like we are a spectrum, you know, we have all of this, all of this stuff, like literally to use the uh, the rainbow spectrum to of experience and perspectives to bring to our crafts, you know, to bring to our, our stories and how we relate to, like, this is a film about an Asian American man, but I relate to it. I relate to Ben because he's kind of like me, but I can also relate to like Miko and I can relate to how the film is talking about all the ways that we are othered in, in like North America in particular, you know, like, like the scene with the twisted bottle cap. I moved here and like in Barbados, we don't have twist caps. We all, uh-huh. all of our bottles are open with bottle yeah. openers. So like I, I had a similar experience with like, trying to open a bond. They're like, oh, twist it. I'm like, you could have told me that from the beginning. So I very much relate to that, you know? And so it's about showing how we are more than, like, we are more than our shortcomings. Yes, I'm going to use the pun and say <laughs> we are more than our shortcomings. Indeed. Yeah, no, I thank you for saying that. It's just so important because especially for future storytellers and future directors, you know, like um, as an Asian American composer, uh, you know, I'm one of few in 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 this field. Mm-hmm. You know, this field is dominated by a certain type, right? I'll just say it that way. <laughs> and um, and there aren't a ton of us. And I just hope that there will be more opportunities for people like me to just be seen like everybody else as a creative, and not just like an Asian composer who uh, has to just do Asian movies because we, you know, maybe can make Asian music. I don't know the first thing about making Asian music. Yeah, what does that even mean? <laughs> what does it even mean? You're right. You know, Korean music, Japanese or, or you know, Chinese, like Kabuki, whatever, right? Pantori. Like, I, 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 that's not my experience. That's not my background. And so I really hope and, and I applaud Randall and his team so much for being so intentional about bringing in folks below the line who represent our community because we bring our experience into the story in service of authenticity, not just because we can do a martial arts sequence or because maybe we can make a something Asian sounding, right? No, no, no. As Asian Americans, we bring our perspective into a story. And I hope that future Asian American creatives and filmmakers can be more relaxed about accepting this reality. Yeah, no, that's true. And yes, and also there's applause to you too, because you did a fantastic job. <laughs> oh, thank thank you so much, Carol. Yeah, no, I I, I generally really I, mean, I I honestly truly um genuinely enjoy this conversation and I and I yeah. love your perspective on the music and like how you saw the character of Ben because it's about bringing just about I think for me, for like composers have to generally, like for me anyway, you generally appreciate the character of Ben and you wanted the audience to to love him more than he possibly loves himself. And it's, and that comes through in in the music because you're like, you're taking time to like give this character his own, his own story and his own, um, his own soundtrack of life. I wish we all had our soundtracks, but then, you know, like we always say, what would my soundtrack, what would my, my, my soundtrack sound like? But like he has his and like he can be like, like his soundtrack could be yours or it could be Randall's or, or Justin who plays um, Ben. Like it could be anyone's soundtrack and it can be something that everyone like they can relate to. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And, oh. and, this, is, and this was great. <laughs> I loved this. Uh, I, I, it's been such a joy to, to speak with you, Carolyn. And, and I just really appreciate your perspective and openness and, um, you know, you're just so informed about different, you know, just so many different kinds of music, and 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 I just really appreciate um, your commentary and what you picked up on. You know, there's nothing more meaningful and um, than having someone like you just pick up on on these things that you just hope. Oh, it, yeah. right, will people notice? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. It was my pleasure, and um, I just had a thought, and it flittered away. 
I don't know why. Um, <laughs> well, at any time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Jean. This is great. <laughs> and congratulations on the film. And I don't know if when when is going to get a theatrical release, but I can't wait to see what other people think about because I'm sure everyone will love it. <laughs> me too. Well, I, I, I certainly hope so. And even if they hate it, it's a conversation starter. <laughs> at least you know I like it. You know, everyone else can hear me. At least, at least, no, Carolyn likes it. <laughs> oh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much.